during my second or third year as a monk, I was translating the John Lee autobiography. And I happened to mention to one of the other monks, who after a couple hours of translation work, I was really tired. He said, what's to get tired about? You just sit there making little marks with your pen. And then after I was working on that for a couple of weeks, he decided he'd try translating it into Isan, which was the dialect in the Northeast. That's where he was from. He gave up after a couple of days. He says he had ended up with a headache every day. The work of the mind is heavy work. To think, you have to use the body. There'll be a little pattern of tension here, pattern of tension there, to correspond to the different thoughts that you want to keep in mind. And if you have a lot to keep in mind, there's going to be a lot of tension. So as we get the mind to settle down, we're trying to unwind some of that tension. But it's still work. It's like a big ball of rubber bands. Some rubber bands are easy to pull off, and others are more entangled. Because as you get the mind to settle down, things should open up inside. And there are parts of the mind that don't want you to open up. They'd rather stay with their shell. Because you have to learn how to work around them. Ultimately, we want to get a full body awareness and a sense of pleasure and ease that fills the body. But there will be parts that resist. And if you focus directly on them, they'll resist even more. They're like wild animals. If you stare at a wild animal, it'll run away. If you act like you don't know that it's there, it'll hang around for a while and not feel so threatened. So when you're dealing with these blockages inside, and they're both mental and physical at the same time, work around them. If there's a tightness in the heart, go down either side. A tightness in the stomach, work down the back. And as you treat the rest of the body with gentleness and sensitivity, these parts may feel less and less threatened, more and more willing to open up. Because you have to realize that when you make up your mind to meditate, it's not like the whole mind has agreed to meditate. There are other parts that will say no. And some of them are old, wounded parts, and others are simply parts that want to have some fun. They like to think. Because after all, the meditation is work. Kamatana. One of the words for meditation literally means that the workplace, the occupation. And for those, you've got to learn how to very quickly, as you settle down, give them the mind is a comfortable place to stay, an interesting place to stay with the breath. Try to take interest in this energy going through the body. After all, a lot of your health depends on it. And John Fuang had a number of students who, among his students who continued meditating after he passed away, the ones who really were most devoted were the ones who seemed, seemed to have a resident illness in one kind or another, and they realized that the only way to keep it under control was to work with the breath. So they had a very good motivation to stick with it. But whatever way you can think about being with the breath and settling down with a sense of ease, to make it interesting and pleasant, you've got to provide the motivation. The Buddha gives his images and analogies for the world, and the world seems to be 
doing its best to show its bad side nowadays. Just when you think things couldn't get worse, they get worse. The human imagination for making a mess is huge. So let that be your motivation. You want something solid that you can depend on. When you see institutions faltering, and people are supposed to be leaders behaving in, in venal ways, it reminds you, you can't really depend on the world. The world offers no shelter. There's no one in charge. It's like a playground where there's nobody watching out for the kids to make sure the bullies don't beat up the, the weaker ones. There's no proctor. There's no one overseeing things. That shouldn't be motivation enough to say, I want something really solid. Because after all, the Buddha is offering something very solid here. Sometimes here it's said that Buddhism teaches lack of essence. And there are some schools of Buddhism that will teach that, that nothing has any essence. It's supposed to be a great thing. Your defilements have no essence, so once you see they have no essence, they have no power over you. But then if your defilements have no essence, then goodness has no essence. What are you going to depend on? This is what I said. There is the essence. Sarna, release is the essence. And there is something that is unchanging that we can find as we dig down into the mind. But it's going to require a lot of digging through a lot of changing things. In building a path, this is the work of the meditation. Turning your state of mind into just a, from just an ordinary state of mind that's looking for pleasure into one that's going to lead you someplace, take you to that changeless essence, because that's the only place where there's safety. But it is there. So thinking about that should get you motivated that whatever the problems you have in the mind, you've got to get around them. And everything can be gotten around. There's no problem in the mind that the path cannot deal with. It's simply up to us to be willing to use the path and to use some ingenuity in applying the basic principles. After all, the Buddha set out the Dharma. He was setting it up for the long term, something that would last for thousands of years. That required making sure that the principles were really clear. But they had to be stated in such general terms that they would apply no matter what the context what the culture, what the time. So we as individuals have to take the basic principles and learn how to use them, how to apply them. And that's where our motivation comes in. It doesn't require a lot of book learning to do this, but it does require a very observant mind, and a mind that's willing to look at itself honestly. Because it's not the case that all the venality and all the problems are out there in the world outside. Because where do these things come from? They come from the human mind. And our human minds have a lot of potentials inside to lead in the wrong direction. So do what you can to motivate yourself, whatever way works for you, to stick with the path and not get discouraged. Not let the parts of the mind that don't want things to open up inside divert your attention off the path. I've heard some people say that working at concentration goes against the basic principles of not-self. 
But then what is the principle of not-self? It's not the principle that there is no self, or there's no one responsible, or there's no one who's going to benefit from this. The Buddha never taught anything like that at all. The basic principle is things that would put you off the path you have to see as not-self. Things that would lead you to do or say or think things that would not be in your best interest. You've got to see those as not-self. And not-selfing is something we do all the time. We decide that something is not worthy of our interest, not worthy of claiming as ours. And we alternate it with selfing, as we claim some things for a while and then other things for another while. And the Buddha is asking us to be more systematic about this, more strategic about this, both these processes. So you do hold on to the precepts, you do hold on to the concentration. You dedicate yourself. After all, the Dharma requires that you commit yourself. And that's the right thing that would pull you away. That's not self. So you need a healthy self in order to practice. And the, what makes it really healthy is that when you've reached the end, you let it go, not out of anger, out of disgust, but simply because you don't need it anymore. Because self and not self are both strategies for happiness. When you've found the ultimate happiness, when you've found that essence, then both those perceptions can be put aside. So take heart that this path does go to something that's free of essence, but it's going to take work. And you have to develop the sense of yourself as being capable of doing it and wanting to do it. And having the resources inside to carry it through. It may be work, but it's good work. And you're working with a sense of comfort. That's what the concentration is for. You're not just strung out, working really hard with nothing to keep you going. The concentration is there as food. But as with any food store, you have to work to make sure it stays well, well stocked. And you've got the right balance of foods for your needs. 